no evidence of worse functional outcomes. Zero. They did better with half the therapy. Less is more, once again. Uh, but one of the most important things that we do, uh, that was done in this model, and we do in our transitions program, is we proactively medically manage the patient, but we proactively psychosocially manage the patient. So there's scripting. When do your skilled days stop? They can't participate, they won't participate, they've plateaued, or they've reached their goal. But you, which, when, which day should you say that? The day before they're discharged, or the day after they're admitted? You have to say it early so they know what the goals are, um, and so families can emotionally prepare for that inevitable discharge. We have, just like in the hospitals, they have forms that you give to the patients, uh, families, or to the patients saying, I, you know, I've declined this discharge. They have the same thing called nom noms in the nursing home. Many times they're not distributed appropriately, or the families just hit the back of the head. They're about to have their mother discharged. They're not ready for that. And they read on the Medicare website, well, my mother gets 100 days, and it's day 10. How much money was saved per nurse practitioner was $103,000 per year. Uh, the cost, this was an interesting cost because that was uh, 2006 or uh, 2003, um, was $425 versus $1,000 from when a patient became ill. So if the patient had a pneumonia, the cost paid to the nursing home went up and we were able to manage those patients more effectively by keeping patients in the nursing home. Um, what about hospital transfers? Where does all of this transfer to, uh, come from? Well, one of the things you need to realize when you're talking about hospital transfers is about 60% of patients um, in nursing homes have cognitive deficit. That's important because it relates to what we were talking about before, which is frailty uh, syndrome issues. The other, the vast majority, have functional impairment. That's why they're there. If they didn't have ADL deficit and functional impairment, they wouldn't be in the nursing home, and that has pro prognostic significance. So this was a study published just a few uh, months ago, um, about a half a million decedents uh, with dementia, and they were looking about the numbers of burdensome transfers to the hospital that served no purpose that they could see whatsoever. And it was very variable, you can see, uh, among the states. Um, I work in California, we're one of the worst uh, uh, states that uses the hospital to manage these patients. Interestingly, I'm not sure, um, it's like a political map sometimes, but uh, if you look at the states that are in the white, they're doing very good. Alaska only transfers about 2% of their patients to the nursing home. I would argue it's because of the difficulty of getting there, um, especially in, in the winter. But what about Hawaii? What's the problem with Hawaii with transferring patients? There's only one main hospital, and you have to fly helicopters to go visit patients from island to island. And so that's why they're also on the difficult to transfer, even though they have beautiful weather. But here's my medical group again. And um, California has uh, about 23, 24% of our patients are readmitted to the hospital. Does that make any sense? Now, group A is doing better than group B, but that's, group A shouldn't be proud of that compared to national statistics. And something else California has to be really proud of is we waste the, the most Medicare dollars on these readmissions. In this study published month, uh, just a few months ago, the quality of care um, seems to be directly correlated or inversely correlated with the frequency for which your patients are transferred to the hospital. So what are the reasons for um, hospitalization? Well, mental status change, dyspnea, uh, these are the issues here. What's the problem? And the problem is that 63% of nursing home patients develop delirium. Delirium is underreported because it's on the report card. And administrators and DONs know this. But if they try to do something to fix the delirium process, they'll be punished by uh, reimbursement, less reimbursement. And so they don't want to do that. They just transfer the patient. And what is, what is the problem, what causes these uh, uh, readmissions, the delirium episodes? Infections and medications are the number one and two causes. What percentage of nursing home patients, I put it on there, have 10 to the 6 uh, bacteria in their year and half of them? Why? Because of the immune senescence of secondary frailty. It's not like it's not going to happen. It is going to happen. And we can have those proactive discussions. Does transferring them to the hospital make that problem better? No. We can, we can address these issues before they're transferred, and we have to be very careful, again, about what medicines we use, which is why any environment where they could have their medications changed or increased medications could make it worse. The average, what's the average number of medications added to a patient's medication list when they're discharged from the hospital? 
Five. <laughs> right, five. What are the risks for hospitalization? Well, they're right here. I'll show you the most important way to keep your patient from getting admitted to the hospital is to do what? Write a do not transfer to hospital order. It's only, it used to be written two to four percent of the time, so I would say, you know, I, I could be a, a, a sales rep and say, well, look at that, that's over a 50 percent improvement. <laughs> you know, but uh, it, those are horrible numbers. Even Pulse doesn't have it. Pulse says you have permission to transfer them if you can't control their uh, symptoms. But it's extremely disrespectful to one of the most important concerns of patients, which is not to become an emotional and economic <coughs> burden to the family. And many patients will say, just treat me here. But we usually wait until they're attended or can't speak for themselves, um, and we end up transferring patients. We shouldn't be doing that. <clears throat> what are the other reasons? These are ones that are actually concrete, that as family physicians, we could do something about immediately. Well, it's lack of on-site provider availability, rapid evaluation, inability to obtain timely labs. I'm not sure they're all necessary, and I'm going to show you why. Um, IV fluids, uh, quality, uh, addressing quality issues. So what do we do in Sharp Healthcare? Well, what we're doing is we now will have five uh, SNF physicians, not 254. And we will consolidate to five facilities. And the quality of care will be that the patient isn't seen once a month and then the doctor leaves and comes out the other side of the nursing home and goes back into their office. But they'll be seen on a daily basis if necessary. They'll be seen twice a day if necessary. It'll just be just like the hospital and we'll be able to improve outcomes. And clear benefits of hospitalization, we talked about those issues. Uh, well, we're, we are going to talk about that. Failure to recognize and discuss with the patient and family the medical evidence regarding the loved one's terminal trajectory. I cannot say that enough as a palliative end-of-life care provider. When we sit down and say, what is the natural progression of the patient's medical condition? They will return to you an answer most of the time. Now, I've had people here today ask me, well, patients don't want to talk about it. That's not true for 80% of the population. We tend to remember that 20% because they're rather vociferous, right? But if you learn how to even deal with those, we can actually have much better conversations. And we're, we, we talk about the tail end of that bell curve, but we're not treating the middle of that bell curve, which is a huge uh, economic and medical responsibility, and there's opportunity there. So these are studies looking at the rates of avoidable hospitalizations. These are some of the bigger and more recent studies. Um, anywhere from 45 to two-thirds of patients, you know, half to two-thirds of patients don't need to go to the hospital. They could have been managed in the nursing home. But it's not surprising that we transfer these folks, because what kind of training are we giving our doctors? Or they, don't, they don't feel very trained. They don't feel well trained. And we're trained to believe what? That the hospital's the best place to manage everybody. And I will ask that question many times. Is that really the case? Or have we culturally just told ourselves that that's the case? Because I'm not seeing that for my decompensations for chronic medical conditions, and I don't see that for nursing home care the majority of the time. So what we use to evaluate uh, transfers to the hospital are what we call the ambulatory care sensitive diagnoses, and these are the issues. Remember, what did I just say causes delirium? Well, it's infections. What's the number one cause of death in a pneumonia patient? I mean, in a demented patient, it's pneumonia. What's the proactive conversation? Mrs. Smith, your demented mother, is almost certainly going to die of a pneumonia. We know that. She's having difficulty feeding. She aspirates. I don't even have to do a, a swallow evaluation. How many people in this room aspirated last night? Does anybody know? 50%. If you had drinks before you went to bed, it went up to 70%. Why didn't you get a pneumonia? Because you're ambulatory, you have a good cough reflex, you do not have immune senescence, I presume. You have ciliary mobility in your bronchial tubes. You, know, you have a different circumstance. So I know how to have the conversation with those patients, families, to say, well, what do you want to do? And we can have those conversations all the time to keep these patients out of the hospital. And I'm going to show you why managing them in the nursing home is actually better. <clears throat> so what about, that, that was just for uh, patients um, regarding the medical issues. But what if we actually have that proactive conversation with what are the goals of care with the patient and family. When, uh, when we do advanced care planning, 90% of admissions are considered avoidable because they don't want to go to the hospital. 
They said, just make me comfortable, treat me here. If you have dementia patients, it goes up to 96%. Isn't that a huge treatment gap in the healthcare industry? A massive treatment gap? I mean, we have all these patients going to the hospital, but 90, 96 don't want to be there. So what about the issues of understanding that choice and conflict? And this was a study I, I do to a lot of presentations. This was initially created for hospice and palliative care providers. But this was 232 uh, demented patients in 22 Boston facilities. And they were asked, do you want no treatment, orals, IV, or IM? And then we did, looked at what was called symptom management in end-of-life care dementia. And we uh, looked at survival rates and uh, quality of outcomes. So when the family says, I just want you to do everything to keep my mother comfortable, but yeah, I'd like antibiotics. What's the best pathway? Well, you can see that if they're treated with antibiotics, it's still a very high, uh, even if they're treated high mortality rate, only about 60, 60 65% survive. But what I want to show you is that there's a very high mortality rate at 90 days. Treating with antibiotics does not improve outcome. It's 30% survival if they're not treated. However, the more traditionally aggressive the treatment, the greater the post-treatment su suffering. So if you move them, if you provided aggressive invasive treatments and they survive, the medical evidence is that because of the delirium, the agitation, the transfer, they do worse, physically. So how do you do this? How do you treat these? What orders do I write? I have other orders, but this is just part of the list. I just keep documenting. Don't transfer. Don't, you know, no hospitalization. We please respect families who request not to have these aggressive treatments. And we have to ask ourselves, you know, who are we treating when we transfer that patient anyways? Well, the nursing home's under pressure because of the regulations. We, I get a call at 2 o'clock in the morning, and I don't want to be held accountable. I'm a, uh, you know, the physician is my colleague's patient. But if we create better models to manage these patients, and we contract with nursing homes, that, and we create the documentation, it's very important to create discussions of documentation to protect the nursing home so that they're not uh, harmed by their DHS evaluations. Um, you can actually keep these patients there. There's a little bit more conflict, and I want to have really take a look at these. What's the medical evidence about improvement in outcomes? I have, you know, we have to ask this question for all of our geriatric and frail patients, but today we're talking about nursing home patients. There are at least 13 evidence-based reasons why transferring these patients to the hospital actually causes physical harm. It's medical harm. I'm not going to talk about all of them, but the physical transfer harm, the rates of delirium go up. As I told you before, the medical evidence, once you induce delirium, you can induce delirium by transferring them. Statistically significant increases in mental decline, physical decline, and higher mortality rates. Hospital, how many people have heard of hospital-associated disability? Okay, I'll talk about that one. It's on the slides. Inability to address the patient's special needs. I hope you can read the rest of the list. Uh, adverse drug events. Adverse drug, we talked about the polypharmacy, they get five more drugs. Adverse drug events are when you go to the hospital, patient has a pneumonia, stop their blood sugar, I mean, their blood pressure medicine, their sugar's up, and then the hospitalist writes hospital-based mentality orders for a nursing home patient. Nursing homes are not little hospitals. Nursing homes are not little hospitals. And when you send somebody home with a tight glucose control, what happens once they stabilize? They plummet back down, they go right back in the hospital because they had a mental status change. And we see that all the time if you don't have your physicians trained on how to proactively keep those orders or rewrite those orders because they're not the right orders when they go back into the nursing home. And what happens when they were taking off their blood pressure medicine? Blood pressure skyrockets, their heart rate goes up, back in the hospital. Uh, infections, adverse procedures. Okay, I have to ask this. For 25 years, I've been a physician. I have never been called by a family member saying, Dr. Hofer, I think my mother just had a delirium episode. And we never hear that. Delirium is markedly more uh, common than TIAs. She was slurring her speech. She wasn't quite you know, coherent at home. And what do we do? We call a stroke code. And they get transferred to the hospital. There's massive evaluation that was not warranted. On our Transitions Dementia Program, we have a whole protocol for delirium management in the home. And I would tell you that we have 100% family satisfaction with the program. 100% of families that have gone in that program said, I will refer my friends and family to your program. 
because they just want to know what to do. They want to be resolved that they're doing the medically and morally right thing. We explain to them what's going on. They don't want to uh, put their uh, mother back into the hospital. They saw her go back in and get worse last time. Why would they do it again? And we talk about the burdens and the anxiety. This is a, just a comment from one of the authors. It was written 20 years ago, but in the era of the hospital, didn't get a lot of attention. Here's another comment I hear. I hear this comment all the time. Well, Dr. Kofer, but they're understaffed and they're not being taken care of. Sure, but all of these studies which show improved outcomes have to do with staffing ratios as they exist now. And I remember once being called onto the floor of my hospital that I work at uh, because they were saying, well, you know, the nurses there just aren't quite as good. Except that the nurses who were working on the medical surge fl uh, floors of the hospital I was at were the same nurses that worked in the nursing home and the staff didn't know it. They're the same nurses many times. They are very well trained. They do have a lot of work to do. But that doesn't mean if we're going to create improvement that we have to use them as a scapegoat for our concerns. We just find ways to improve the nursing home care. So <clears throat> what's the pathophysiology pathophysio <coughs> behind a lot of this? Well, bed immobilization, I want you to think about what happens when a patient goes to the hospital. They get tons of attention, they get put in bed, they can pee in bed, they can eat in bed, they do not have to do anything. Is that good? No. It's horrible to put a patient in bed, especially these patients without a lot of physiologic reserve, because whatever they have, they may lose. They, you'll see what we say, we've got a 600% distribution of plasma volume, they, don't, they get accelerated muscle loss, uh, they don't breathe as well, which is why they get more pneumonias. It takes a while to resolve. Sensory deprivation, accelerated bone loss. The muscle issue, when you put a frail or demented nursing home patient into the hospital and immobilize them, they lose 5% of their muscle force per day. 5%. What's the average length of stay of your patients when they go to the hospital? Four days, five days, six days, they just lost 30% of their muscle force. It doesn't come back necessarily. <clears throat> Hospital associated disability is a recently, we, we see this all the time, or we saw it all the time in the nursing home. They recently made a definition uh, for this. It's a loss of one ADL needed to live independently. So now we're moving to the outpatient environment, but we can still understand the issues. It occurs in about one third of patients over the age of 70. Frail patients are at higher risk. It occurs even if the illness is successfully treated. Less than 50% of patients with uh, hospital-associated disability had recovered to pre-illness levels at one year. That's not exactly a true statement, and I'll show why. This was actually came right out of the article. It's because 41% died within a year. That's evidence-based prognostication. Your antennas should go up, our antennas should go up when these patients go in and they have ADL loss before we discharge them. I keep trying to teach my primary care physicians in my group document ADL deficiencies, um, you know, bathing, grooming, dressing, toileting, transferring, and feeding in your charts. Because even a subtle loss has significant importance about how that patient's disease is manifesting on where they are in that um, in the trajectory. And we talk about uh, pediatricians using um, that type of a scale. Well, we can use that scale on the other side. What happens about 50% uh, uh, regain uh, to normal uh, levels and about the other 50%, the, other the ones that didn't die, uh, remain permanently disabled. So here's a, an immediate change that we should make when we're dealing with nursing homes. Immediate. Do it today. I would never tell a nursing home, a patient's family in the nursing home, that we'll get you back to where you were before. That's not going to happen half the time. I would tell them, we'll do everything we can to get you to the best functional level or get their mother to the best functional level. When you set expectations here, but the best is here, what happens? Overutilization. Emotionally unprepared for the inevitable consequences of the best that the healthcare industry has to offer. We become antagonistic, uh, especially when we have to discharge the patient from service and mom's not back to the way she was before. <clears throat> How do you prevent hospital associated disability? Now, think about what we do in the hospital and think about what you should do in a nursing home. This is why nursing homes do better. They have carpets on the floor, they, they are in the same environment, the same smells, the same sounds. Uh, decrease uh, or, uh, or increase in courage activity. You know, what do we do in the hospital? Bed rest. No, don't bed rest these patients. It may actually be a good thing that there's not enough staffing because when you really got to pee, you get out of bed. Now, we want to make that environment safe, but the best thing to do is to leave them there so that they get up and move 
and don't lose muscle strength. Um, <clears throat> no, nothing that restrains the patient's IVs, uh, enables safe mobility, uh, ADL independence, don't help, street clothes, stop medications. Um, I love this one. When I'm, I, I showed you yesterday everything I'm doing proactively to keep my patient's weight on and to keep them uh, as healthy as possible so that their albumin doesn't drop, their cholesterol doesn't drop. They come back from the hospital, ADA diet, American Heart Association diet, not appropriate. Just not appropriate for these patients in the nursing home. It's the antithesis of what we're doing. And I would argue that when you take these patients and put them in the hospital, it's the exact opposite of the care, which is necessary. So if we can reframe the way we think, I said yesterday, we need to think of life as a bell curve, not an S curve, recognize the right care for the right patient at the right time. We can create models, especially incapitated models, where you got this much to take care of them, and the old standard was this much dollar spent with worse outcomes, now you spend this much dollars and you have better outcomes. And if we can do that as groups and create that, you know, we're not in the hospital as much as we used to be, um, we can actually do better. Can you predict hospital-associated disability? Well, just as you can prognosticate for hospital-induced delirium, you can predict for disability. Uh, if you go to the nursing home, what percentage of patients, even a stage two ulcer, but the majority of them will have some, at least two and three, and probably four. So they already have three points on this scale. If you have three or four points, you have an 83% possibility of developing hospital-associated disability. Which nursing home patients don't? Probably that ambulatory patient that's demented but just can't, there's no social support at home to take care of them. But the other ones with the, the functional disability, not doing as well. I want to show you something about uh, prognosticating because there's functional impairment, very important. Here's a, um, prog the Walter prognostic score when patients are not going to do well after discharge from the hospital. I want to show what's in here. ADL uh, performance is extremely important. Laboratory values, albumin's right there, the kidney function's there, I think th that those are important issues. The strongest associated uh, uh, prognostic tool in nursing homes for a patient's demise is their functional status. So when we send them to the hospital and they get worse and they already have bad ADL function, that's a, that's a bad sign. We should not only be treating them when they come back, but we should be having some discussions with these folks about how to appropriately manage them the next time it happens. This is uh, the symptoms that we see for patients before they, they die. But what are all these issues? You know, uh, shortness of breath, pain, uh, and delirium, or aspiration, agitation. Well, that's the same list for what they got readmitted to the hospital. But they're the same signs before the patients die. And by the way, these are the same signs, the symptoms that we treat when the patients are on palliative care and hospice services. I want you to, I'm going to go back just for a second so you don't get a read that. So you're on call as a family physician or your, your doctors are on call. You have a patient in a nursing home. The patient has a pneumonia. What do you ask the nurse for? Well, I was trained to ask temperature, blood pressure, you know, cyanosis, O2 sat, stuff like that. Anybody, anything else? Okay. DNR status. DNR status. Okay, those are important issues. What are the most prognostic signs that a patient won't do well uh, with pneumonia in the hospital? So this was a study looking at multiple issues related to the uh, relative risk of death when the patient's hospitalized. And you can see all the issues here. What were the top six highest relative risk issues for a patient dying when they were hospitalized? ADL deficit, kidney function, albumin, and cholesterol. So, the nurses have a hard time when I'm on the phone because they call and say, Dr. Hofer, you know, uh, Mrs. Jones, uh, Dr. Jones's patient, um, you know, Mrs. Smith, uh, she has a pneumonia. And I, the first question is, well, what's your cholesterol level? <laughs> can, can she feed herself? You know, those are the issues that actually give us better evidence. By the way, when you look at these, what's the difference between this list and the list that I said, you know, in the traditional sense? You know all of this information a week ahead of time, a month ahead of time, three months ahead of time, six months ahead of time, depending on whether you're monitoring these laboratories every time a custodial patient gets admitted to the nursing home. So isn't it interesting that the most highly prognostic markers are never used? I've never had a physician or resident, occasionally I've worked with residents, say, oh yeah, the patient's cholesterol level was 120. Um, 
should this be mandatory? You know, we have uh, certain mandates under the uh, MDS, uh, which is a, a list of uh, information that the nursing homes have to collect on their patients. Should we be collecting this information so that we know what's coming instead of waiting the reactive model, wait till it's here, the proactive model, uh, deal with it before it's here so we can decide what the goals of care of the patient and family are. This, these happens to be the orders that I write on a routine basis because they're all prognostic. Less is more. This is research articles showing that you have better outcomes by treating the patient in the nursing home. This is better outcomes for mortality, for treating patients with pneumonia, um, either no acute improvement or when you look two months down the road, there was one article out of JAG showing that there was statistically significant increase in uh, functional decline, mental decline, and mortality if you transfer them to the hospital. <clears throat> more evidence about the negative consequences. I just want to show you a couple of things because I heard people mention these yesterday. Your bone loss accelerates 50 times when you lie in bed for this, for this demographic. 50 times what it was before. It's no wonder they get fractures. Don't put them in bed. Worst thing you can do, get them up and move them. Increased prevalence of incontinence increases because they get out of their, their normal patterns. You know, I know after breakfast at 10 o'clock to sit on the toilet because I'm going to pee anyways. And I do it at, you know, before noon as well because my bladder doesn't empty as well as it should. When we put them in the hospital, we destroy their routines and they start to become incontinent. They get a Foley catheter, which is not indicated, um, and things get worse. <coughs> Pecutus formation, I told you about this yesterday. The reason we get moved, turned every two hours, the standards are because the people in this room have 32 millimeters of capillary arterial pressure. But these patients don't. And you would have to move them. I have, sorry, I've become a comedian once in a while, but I imagine them on a rotisserie so that, you know, that's the only way to prevent bed sores from occurring. I've seen excellent nursing homes not able to prevent bed sores, not because they're not doing a good job or following standards of care. It's because the patient changed. And we can explain these issues to the families so that it doesn't become a lawsuit, and we can participate in advanced care planning so they can decide on their goals of care. I love this one. We took uh, college students and put them into a simulated hospital room. And after two and a half hours, two and a half hours, they had EKG, or EEG documented sensory distortions. Is it surprising that these uh, you know, cognitively impaired older folks get into a hospital and become delirious? I don't think so. It's just well known that if you change the environment of these folks, they become confused. There's just that cascade of dependency. Uh, we need to remember this every time we transfer a patient or put them to bed permanently. Special needs, uh, just lack of time, and move through this. Adverse drug events we talked about. Uh, anytime you transfer a patient, we all deal with this medication reconciliation, just the transfer itself, being sure we're communicating well, we have issues with this. And I'm just going to say briefly, so we, you can answer questions, that when we do studies asking patients and families what they want, they tell us that they want simply to be informed about their patient's, their mother's prognosis, their prognosis. I'll show you some of the statistics here. <clears throat> only 20% of patients' families felt their loved ones had six months left to live. The only worst prognosticators, according to medical evidence and healthcare providers, are patients and families. So if we regain that skill of evidence-based medical prognostication, we can do better aligning our patient's perspective with reality. That's a critical issue. Bring that perspective into the truth, and then they'll choose a different pathway that's consistent with their goals of care. Only 18% felt they've received any prognostic information, so they're left, you know, what do we do? I don't know. I'm not going to say no until somebody says it's okay to say no. About a third said they received counseling from their physician, but the other two-thirds did not. I just wanted to show you some of this data. There's our um, proactive um, dementia program. Some of these patients are in the outpatient environment, some are in the nursing home. I'd like to look at the bottom. That's either very good or good. We have 100% satisfaction. It's all proactive education. We had a month where we had our late state dementia population with zero hospitalizations. Zero. But, but, and something else, by the way. We have a medical group where we had zero people leaving the medical group and we just keep hiring more people. The last person to leave my office was about 10 years ago. And in my region, I don't remember what the last person was because nobody wants to leave. They come and they stay. That's excellent 
patient management because we've created an environment where people look prospectively at, at what they're doing, they get to go home, but they're very active in managing patients using different models of care. So um, anyways, uh, what I would just say is that we need to hardwire these policies, we need to take a different look at these, these issues. I realize this is not available to everybody right now because everybody doesn't have a capitated model, but I would be, if I was a family physician in an area where I was not penetrated by capitated models, I would be out, out right now looking for nursing homes that were going to participate in value-based purchasing or capitated plans, and I would be looking for hospitals that were trying to find uh, management tools to keep their patients from being readmitted. So. Great talk, Dan. You, you ought to give uh, grand rounds at every hospital in the country. Uh, a fall with a hip fracture is often the terminal event for people. We know it's going to happen soon. Do you have any rules for avoiding a surgery, you know, avoiding the hospitalization, and then you know, if you find a hip fracture, it's you know, I just, I remember the days we used to put them in traction and work, but I just mm -hmm. don't see that anymore. Yeah, well, if you have a late stage dementia patient, first of all, you know, I told you yesterday, 53% mortality at six months. If they're in pain, they may, there may, be, may be some benefit to, to pinning the hip, or if they're ambulatory. But we routinely do not repair hips for patients that are not in pain, or their pain can be easily controlled with opioids. And you say, well, opioids, this, that produces delirium. Well, so does pain. So it's kind of a balance of those two issues. But if they're uh, bed bound and they slip out of bed and break a hip, I don't fix those most of the time. I don't even have the orthopedist. I have a comment and also a question. Um, when I was a resident and I trained at Duke uh, Family Practice, mm -hmm. we actually did home visits mm -hmm. uh, in the nursing home. Each resident had a certain number of folks. Uh, each um, FP resident had a certain number of folks that they followed. Um, and so the, the correlated question to that is, my daughter lives in Scotland. Um, and I remember visiting with her to one of her friends' home, and in the back room was uh, this person's mom, bed bound, but at home. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit, you've been talking about the nursing home, but I would imagine the same paradigm might be true for um, uh, how we do a better job of keeping people at home. Because my guess is that's what most of us would like to do, and my guess is we can get pretty good results that way. Well, you know, the management issues, again, are just proactive management for our dementia program, I actually wrote a caregiver's guide, so nothing was a shock. I don't let the incontinence be a shock. Uh, dementia, by the way, is a mental disease, it's a physical decline disease, it's a physiologic decline disease, it's a financial decline disease, and it's a caregiver stress disease. You need to talk about all of those so none of them are a shock. And then they have a different morally resolved treatment pathway instead of using the hospital as an in and out tool. I actually think they use the hospital as respite care. But when you have those discussions proactively, uh, our patients, some of them do end up in, uh, you know, board care assisted living or, uh, because it's just too much for the caregiver, but they rarely use the hospital. And if they do, you know, they're in and out fairly quickly. So, um, you know, it really just to me, it means that we have to start having better discussions and better talks, and we have to change that paradigm from waiting for the patient to be broken and tell them what's going to happen, to tell them this is a disease-specific trajectory. One of the problems with uh, advanced directives in this country is, first of all, we have stage one where nobody has anything, stage two where they do have a, a, a major medical condition that looks like it's going to take their life, but do we have advanced directives which are disease-specific? No. And so with Transitions Program, what we do is we have disease-specific discussions about that natural course of this patient's disease trajectory, every time. And so nothing's a surprise even if they choose to go to the hospital. The majority don't, that 10, 20% do, the other 80% don't. But if you haven't had the discussion, where are they gonna go? They're gonna choose the two pathways that have been offered to them, stay at home and suffer, or go to the hospital. So they go to the hospital. We, we actually come out to them, so we've created a program where if you're having a problem, number one, the patient or caregiver catches it earlier so we can nip it in the bud. And then number two, um, you know, they, don't, they have a choice to call us so that we can go out and help them versus having to transfer the patient to the hospital. But that's gonna create a, a reimbursement uh, structure change, a paradigm shift. Uh, it's available, but it's gonna be a paradigm shift uh, in the healthcare industry.
So uh, great, great talk, very informative. I, um, I'm curious if you have had any experience with, in terms of attempting to hardwire this kind of information and evidence into your system uh, using uh, clinical decision support tools in an electronic medical record. Uh, we're working on it. Okay. Like I said. So over time, uh, family practice physicians have narrowed the scope of practice such that most all are purely ambulatory now. They admit to hospitalists. Someone goes to the nursing home, it's, well, whoever the medical director of the nursing home is can handle that. So what's the catalyst? Uh, I'm under the impression there aren't too many non-hopers across the country. So what's the catalyst for a family practice group to incent a physician to get involved in this scope of practice again? Well, first of all, it's good care. Number one, it's evidence-based care. Um, and the medical evidence is that patients live longer and do better. Number two, it's consistent with the goals of care of the patient and the family, and then um, it's uh, economically uh, self-sustaining. It's a cost uh, benefit to the system. If you have the right contracts in place, if you're capitated, it's tremendously cost-effective. Um, Value-based value -based purchasing does that for nursing homes, um, ACO models, Medicare Advantage models. Um, now, I realize it's a little bit different, and so you have to look for different reimbursement structure. And right now, under the 2010 Health Care Act, um, you know, I, what we suggest is that the hospital, there's, is there anybody, you know, any evidence that stopping a readmission for 30 days is going to lower health care costs? I sure don't. I mean, it's just a tool to not have people be readmitted. But that means nothing to that demented patient where all those problems with their, where they had a pneumonia, they just come right back, they get it again. Some of them get it less than 30 days. So, you know, but if I was a hospital and there was a way to be profitable by helping them and we're working with hospitals with that, that issue, we, we actually take a third of our patients a fee-for-service, so we're looking at those patients too to find ways to work with the hospital to keep them out and we actually have already started some projects uh, related to this issue we're getting reimbursed for. So, it, but, it, but I realize that a lot of it's financially motivated and that's unfortunate because it's pushed us down treatment pathways that are not consistent with best practice. Quick question, um, who makes up your transition team? I mean, is it a social worker, is it an RN? Who's part of that team? Well, the outpatient transitions team is uh, supervised by a physician, uh, and then it's a uh, nurse practitioner, it's a social worker, 